Sciences at the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture. Rowan has specific research focusing on increasing legumes in mixed swords uh, in low to medium rainfall, cool temperate regions. So uh, we might just welcome Rowan to the stage. Uh, thanks very much, and I'd just like to, to thank LLS for having me up here. I had a commitment in Sydney with Richard Hayes, and um, I said, oh, can you show me a few things around New South Wales? He said, well, I've actually got this event, um, which is in the, in the way a little bit. Oh, how about you just come and present at that, and we'll have a look at a few things on the way. So that was um, certainly very good um, for me uh, to be able to do that and um, combine a couple of things. So. Um, I guess my talk today is going to be mostly focused on the establishment of legumes and our project work at the moment is still, um, while we've been working on um, perennial legumes for a fair while, it's still in the early stages. So it's a little bit about what we're doing, what we've found to date um, and some, probably some things towards the end that you might be able to take home and maybe put into practice. Um, Great to hear um, the talks already that kind of lead into my talk a little bit. Um, certainly the value of legumes in pastures we know that it, it can, the, the energy in it can drive um, live weight gain in, in sheep and cattle. So um, we, we know if we can get that legume content up, um, we, can, we can shift the ME from 10 to 12 and that might end up being the difference between 150 grams a day uh, to 300 grams a day in, in, in lamb. So it does make a big difference and it's, I, I believe it's worth, uh, worth looking at. Just a quick thing about Tassie. So you might be thinking, oh, it's all green and... Rosie down in Tassie, um, not really relevant to your area here, but we actually have quite a big area of, um, of pastures. So that you see the green area on the left-hand side. There's a lot of, a lot of country that's sort of 600 um, mils and below um, and, and very similar country to here, perhaps only different in that you're getting more summer rain and we're getting probably more consistent winter rain. Um, and these are the two study areas that we're working in at the moment. Um, we're working with beef uh, farmers in the northwest in the high rainfall zone and sheep farmers, um, more particularly in the Midlands area. Um, this is a, this is a um, I guess, a diagram that uh, our honours student put together after um, our perennial legume work that we'd done over, uh, I think this was at the end of three years of growth, particularly during the dry period of uh, 18, 19, 20, and we we're looking at just the recovery of those plants. Um, and what we were seeing in our, in our work there was that white clover, the plants that were there, and there weren't many of them, this is what their structure and their, the root structure looked like underneath, which you know, is reasonably, reasonably well known. Um, and you look there across towards Lucerne and, and what that can do. So it wasn't just the amount of root there, it was also the number of plants that we're seeing in that, in that zone. But the, the other thing I want to try and, and um, sort of emphasise uh, with you here is that from a perennial legume space, we don't have a lot of options um, for, the, for the temperate regions. We've kind of got white clover at one end that loves water and it'll keep soaking up water, Richard tells me, and, and just is a kamikaze plant and will die only after it's soaked up all the moisture. Um, compared to lucerne, obviously a long-lived deep-rooted perennial that can access moisture deep in the soil profile. So obviously in this area here, lucerne is a, is a, um, is a really important plant and if you've got the ability to plant it, it's going to do some wonderful things for you. Talish clover and Caucasian clover, very difficult to get seed, has a lot of a lot of attributes that we're looking for, but again, really haven't made the mark. So we're kind of down to um, looking to see whether we can manipulate white clover or then go to red clover, strawberry clover as other options. But again, they really don't have the drought tolerance that we see in Lucerne. This uh, little figure here is one that I, at the start of our project, I started thinking, well, what can go wrong with um, establishing legumes in pastures? And it's, there's, there's so many things that can go, go wrong. And it's little wonder that we've got you know, small amounts of legume in our, in our pasture base and we're, we're trying to boost it up because, like I say, a lot can go wrong. Uh, and so as we go, as we go across um, from left to right, we start to get towards success of a legume in the pasture. And these things that I'm putting here are just things that can go wrong. And then I guess down the bottom here, where some of the management things that we can, we can put in place or advice that we can get to try and um, improve that uh, establishment of that legume. 
So there's a lot of things that we can do pre-sowing around weed control and ground preparation and, and really the important one is also species selection. So selecting the species that's right for that purpose and right place. That's nothing new, that's a message that's been coming through from extension, um, well, I guess our extension arms across Australia for a long time, but it's still really, really important. So getting to sowing, things like sowing rates and the timing of sowing and using correct rhizobia, all important things for this um, establishment of the legume. Once you get to establishment and then grazing, other things start to, start to come in, other things that want to eat it, whether it be pests, weeds, wildlife, um, and, and the like, and, and then animals start selective grazing. So there's all these things that are really um, needing to be managed by the time we get there. Then we're you know, having to maintain soil condition and then seasonal stresses. And there's you know, obviously been through enough seasonal stresses for and against, I guess, over the last few years to know that that's a really important factor as well. And there's some things that we can do, obviously, to, to look after our pastures. And then that plant's then either got to set seed as an annual or regenerate and grow again as a perennial. So there's so many things there that can go wrong. And, and so I'm saying to you, it, it is, you know, we, we need to work hard on management and actually plan if we want to have a good productive legume in our pastures. So what, what I'm focusing on today and what, um, what we've been focusing on mostly is around sowing technique and what we can do to advantage that legume in a grass, in a mixed pasture with grass. So grass has got this real advantage compared to a legume at sowing, um, and what can we do to really push that legume along? Uh, must have gone the wrong way here, have I? Thank you. So our project um, has been focused on some uh, establishment experiments, so establishing pastures from scratch, and, and trying to get legumes up that way, but also looking at how can we re-establish legumes in a pasture that's already established. You might have a dominant grass pasture. How can we get legumes back into that without taking the risk of a whole pasture renovation phase? Uh, and then some waterlogging work that I won't talk too much about today, and then really working with farmers on a lot of these things. So our first, our first experiment was looking at how can we advantage this legume? Can we uh, either spatially separate it, so getting back to what Richard was discussing before about having legume in one row and the grass in the other to try and give that legume some advantage, uh, and then also potentially sowing the legume first and then coming back and sowing the, gr the grass um, in the following autumn. Uh, and so we've, we've been trialling that across a, couple of, uh, a, a few sites over the last couple of years. We haven't really nailed it yet because in some years, well, at a couple of locations, we've had poor grass establishment, great legume establishment, and then the opposite at, at other sites. So it's been really difficult for us to be able to evaluate that competitive um, relationship and, and just try and work out what's going on there. Where we have had some good, um, good results come back so far is in another experiment where we're trying to um, re-establish uh, legumes in a grass dominant sward. And we're doing that by using uh, a couple of different uh, sowing techniques, so broadcast sowing, so just spitting the seed out on top, direct drilling is a tr more traditional method, and then using a strip till technique that I've been using, particularly in, um, in, in cover cropping and, and, and the like, probably from more of a regen angle. Uh, and we were looking at how we can use herbicide potentially to try and retard the growth of, of the grass for a little while while those legumes are getting established. So this was an example of what we were looking at. So a phalaris space pasture at the end of winter. So as you can see there, really good ground cover, um, but no, absolutely no legume in it. So we know if we can get a legume into this, this will really extend the feed value of that phalaris pasture heading into, into summer. And, and and as we talked about today, increasing um, intake as well. So what, was, what, what some of the early preliminary results are showing was that um, and at least initially the strip till and the direct drill had higher, higher um, plant counts compared to just broadcasting the seed on top. And remember, um, 2020, 21, 21 for Tassie was quite wet year. It was a really you know, a, a good year to be sowing pastures. So um, I suspect we'd get different results in a, in a dry year. Um, but then as, 
as, uh, the, as, as we moved into 2021, that relationship seemed to flatten a little bit, so broadcast wasn't that far behind the other two in the second year. Um, it's reasonably common for, for, for you to see a, a, you know, a, a um, decline in plant count from one year for the, from the first year to the next, so that wasn't um, necessarily um, concerning for us. What we did see, though, is a real advantage of using a low rate of herbicide to try and hold the vigour of that phalaris pasture at the start of spring and that, let that legume get established. So pretty much where we didn't use the herbicide, um, at, at least initially we had a few plants, but then that really crashed because of that um, phalaris pasture sucking the moisture out, out, of, out from underneath the legume. So we do see a real advantage in using that if we're going to spring sow um, some legumes into, into phalaris pastures. One, the other, other probably big thing that we saw across all the species that were sowed was that red clover was probably the best of, best of the lot in terms of its ability to establish in that situation. Um, and uh, probably put that down to that seed being a, a bit bigger and that seedling being a bit more vigorous um, as, as a seedling. So it's in competition with that grass. You want something that's going to be able to get up and growing pretty quickly before the phalaris starts to re-establish. So that was, um, I guess, something that we had reason reasonable suspicion, but it was good to show. And that's what it looks like. So the left-hand side there um, is the uh, direct drill red clover, uh, and then on the right-hand side, um, the uh, strip till. We're doing the same thing in a perennial ryegrass, so in the high rainfall environment as well. So just uh, changing the species a little bit, but the same idea, trying to sow um, some of those legumes back into a, a ryegrass dominant pasture, which is not uncommon um, in our northwest region where they've been over many years pr pretty happy to take the nitrogen out of a bag rather than get it out of a plant. So, um, but what we're seeing is a shift, shift back towards people being interested in, in what legumes can do, which is good. Um, one big thing that we've seen, the difficulty we have in that high, ra high rainfall environment is just slugs um, ha being a, bit, a big issue being within that uh, existing pasture. So um, the damage that they've caused it, um, pretty soon after, uh, after germination is something that uh, is probably potentially a barrier to this type of work. Um, this, as part of our work, we've been working with a number of producers and this is kind of the... Um, the pick of one of our, oh, I guess, the producers that are trialling different things and really ramping up legumes in pastures. So this is a really high red clover coxfoot um, mix and he's spinning off um, beef cattle on this at a pretty rapid rate. And, uh, but this is not so much, not, this type of mix isn't very common in this high rainfall zone, but we're seeing that coxfoot very complementary to other legumes. Um, this is similar work that we've been doing um, at, a, at another property and, and again just over sowing um, legumes um, and looking at ways that we can shorten that preparation window um, in terms of being able to jump when the, when the conditions are good and are getting a legume in. Uh, similar type of thing on some hump and hollow country where uh, we really have drainage issues, so we're looking at uh, different, uh, I guess, waterlogging tolerant um, legumes, and that's probably where the, the strawberry clover is going to have a fit. And uh, and also um, on on some sandier country, using a uh, using a uh, rye corn forage um, over winter to just stabilise some of this new ground uh, and and get some grazing over winter before a spring sowing of the legume. So um, we're We've got a lot of uh, on-farm demonstration work with best bet or certainly best, best knowledge uh, so far that we can go ahead with. Uh, another project that we've been working on has been funded through the Future Drought Fund and, and on a similar line is just what we can do to limit the risk of sowing new pastures, um, particularly as climate change is starting to have a, a bigger effect. Can we, uh, like I say, jump into jump into pasture sowing without too much preparation. Uh, if we go back up, this is just some of the work that we've done and again, looking at whether or not we need to use a herbicide um, prior to sowing. So in this case, on the left-hand side, we've strip-tilled a number of different species and what you're seeing there is particularly coxfoot and chicory uh, growing really well at the back end of summer. 
Uh, and so the one on the left had the herbicide pre-sowing, the one on the right uh, didn't. Uh, that was just sown into existing ryegrass pasture. So you can see the competition effect that just knocking that out and, and just one application and drilling straight into the existing pasture had. Um, so we got a, we've had a really, really good result there. Um, the strip tillage uh, is an interesting one uh, in terms of whether there is actually an advantage of doing it that way. Um, same again here. So this is just direct drilling and we see far better, I guess, coverage of, of that um, area with the, with the target um, species that we're sowing. But again, same result, far better uh, with using the herbicide pre-sowing and it only needed to be three or four days and, and we got a far better result. So, um, yeah, bit much, much better uh, result. And this is probably in a drier environment, but again, Coxfoot was looking pretty good and the chicory at the end of summer. So talking about those mixes that are going to be resilient in our area, I think, um, you know, Coxfoot's been known for a long time, but chicory's probably a plant that's been underutilised and, and certainly one that we can look towards in the future. Uh, just probably finally is just touching on some work we're doing with um, uh, CSIRO, New South Wales DPI in the Cerradella space. So we've teamed up with them, CSIRO are leading it. And we're looking at trying to, um, I guess, get some new knowledge around uh, Cerradella cultivars um, for the eastern states. A lot of our knowledge um, thus far has been um, has, has come across from the lay farming or phase farming work that's been done in WA and we know those conditions are quite, quite different to what we experience here in the east. So um, what we're trying to do with the initial flowering experiments is just matching the cultivars to the environments. There's a few more cultivars on the market now than what there was previously. Can we do a better job in, in picking the right cultivar for the right place? We're also doing some work understanding hard seed breakdown and we're seeing a lot of variation uh, across the cultivars as well. So again, picking the right cultivar for the situation, we're hoping to get to a point where we're gonna get better at that. Also, you know, persistence experiments are obviously important. We want these uh, legumes to last a bit longer. Uh, and, and Richard um, has just started some sowing rate experiments as well. All of this hopefully will lead into an improved agronomy package for for um, the eastern states, for, for Cerradella, and hopefully we can get to a point where it's much more regionalised. We can get down to some recommendations for regions. Um, one thing that I just wanted to uh, point out and, and something maybe that you can take home and, and, and I guess understand and maybe ask the question going forward is just around um, not just Cerradella uh, particularly, but uh, just clover seed in general. Um, so we've got seed, seed there on the left, so in Cerradella, sometimes it'll be sold as bare seed, sometimes it'll be sold as pod, and then sometimes it, it might even have a coat on it. And so there's a range of different, um, what, what that seed is called might be different in different areas or di called di different things from different people. So it's important that you understand what you're actually getting. So the, plat the, the seed is generally in a pod bit, Bit uh, like a segmented pod that will actually break up into each of those segments. If we take that pod off it, it becomes what we would call um, bare seed, or but it's sometimes called dehulled seed or scarified seed to an extent. And then you go through uh, at the other end. We could have pot. We could end up having a coating over the top of pod, or we could have a coating over the top of the bare seed. So there's a number of different, I guess, vagaries there that you need to understand what what you're getting. Why that is important is because when we go back to looking at um, recommended sowing rates, it, that needs to be taken into account. So, for example, what um, five kilos, the sowing rate of, uh, recommended rate of five kilos might be for, for a bear seed might actually be 10 or 15 kilos of pod and then might be actually 20 to 25 if, the, if that pod or if that seed had been coated as well. So you need to understand that and ask the question around around that. Why that's important is when you start to look at a sowing rate of say five kilos a hectare, it might end up being around, the, and it, this is just an example, it's not picking on any particular cultivar or, or product, it might end up being around 200 um, seeds per metre squared. If, if we're only sticking to that five kilos as the recommended sowing rate and we're taking that as, 
at, 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 for, for using pot as well, and we don't do that, well, we're taking half the weight there. So um, we're ending up with only half as many seeds as what we're putting actually in the ground. Do that again with adding a, pot, adding a, a coating over the top. That's adding to that weight. And if you're still sowing or setting up the drill to sow at five kilos, you're, still, you're getting even less seeds again. So you're potentially hamstringing yourself. So what I'm saying is ask the question about what, if it, if it is coated, how much uh, weight is that seed coating adding to the seed and is the recommended rate based on what the coated seed weight is or is it re the recommended rate based on what the original bare seed rate is? It's worth asking the question. The other thing that's uh, uh, worth looking at as well is that there's, there's, there's um, varietal or cultivar differences as well in those weights. So you can see the variation of, and this is work from, that Richard's done that's yet to be published, but how many seeds are actually sown per metre squared if you're still using that at a 10 kilo sowing rate. So you can see quite big variations of the number of seed that actually goes into the ground. And for, for, for just reference as well, even, even in something like subclover, um, cultivar differences for weight is, is certainly a big thing. So you might consider um, altering your sowing rates based on that. And that's even before we get to a understanding whether the um, seed is old or what the germination rate of the seed is if it's, if it's older seed that it might have a lower germination rate, you should be scaling up as well. I guess my take home messages from, from this work is that, um, and I guess I challenge, challenge you, you all in your mixed pastures, whether it's just a small area or big areas, just what, what legume is doing the work for you in that pasture. Um, it, it can really drive intake and, and certainly um, getting, getting that into the animal and seeing real realised gains in terms of live weight can really make a big difference. So um, ha having a look at different pastures, it might not be just the same legume in one spot, it might be uh, multiple legu different legumes across different parts of the pasture and then it might be a brassica or something else. These other um, plants can really add to the grass base that really does the bulk of the work. The, um, the legumes can add the cream that really makes things work. Um, in terms of sowing rates, like I say, just be, be, um, be aware of what you're buying, how that how might, might relate to sowing rates. Ask the question whether it's been inoculated recently or whether it's been sitting in the shed for six months. That'll have a bit of a, uh, an effect on whether that inoculant or rhizobium that's on that seed is, is alive or dead. And take care of the seed when you're taking it home. And stick it on the back of the truck and leave it out in the sun all day and then expect the plant to work later on. Um, it, it, you've got a live product on that seed if it's rhizobia, you need to treat it as such. Um, there's a few other resources about at the moment. Obviously within MLA, legumes are a big push and they want to see legumes adopted, so there's a lot of resources coming online uh, at the moment. They've got a legume hub with uh, resources being added to that all the time. You can check out our work um, through, our, through our website as well. And I guess the other, other thing for our guys down, in, down south that we don't see as much of compared to up here as bloat. I'm not sure whether that's because we've had lower legume contacts in their pastures and we just aren't ramping the system up as much as you or, or we've got a lower, lower amount or whether there's some other differences down there. But we haven't, over the last 20 odd years, haven't seen a lot of bloat differences. Maybe it's just because it's uh, all grass, but. It's something that we need to keep an eye on and, and there are things that you can do about it. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for your time. Appreciate uh, having me here. Well, yeah, thanks, Rowan, for that. And, uh, yeah, Rowan will be back up here in the Q&A session shortly. Um, just a bit of a reminder, your little blue folders. 